Welcome to the Upward Live YouTube page. We believe you're already subscribed, but if you haven't, take a second and click that subscribe button now because we share weekly videos of encouragement around here and you wanna make sure you don't miss a single one. We're excited for the word that you're about to hear because we know it's gonna shift something in your life. And you can look back and know that God met you here today. But also, share that encouragement with a friend, with a family member, with a coworker, or anyone you know, because they need it as well. And while you're listening to this message, if you feel led to sow, do so by using any one of the various giving methods you see on your screen. And if you want to get connected in other ways or get some more information about the church, check out our description box below. We are going to change a life here today. So let's hop right into this message. Every now and then, you know, I'm, I'm very active with the kids uh, in our church whose parents are specifically on home team and really in particular the kids who may not have fathers that are active in their lives. So I find myself on weekends uh, going to football games, um, I'm at award ceremonies through the year, I'm going to graduations as they get older and you know and one of the things I do for our kid leads uh, whose parents serve on home team is for their birthdays I actually buy them Jordans. I didn't get to get Jordans till I got older. I remember my mom bought me my first pair of Jordans. She worked a couple jobs. She found out I got made fun of in school one day because I came home frustrated. She took her whole paycheck and took me and got me out. I'm dating myself. But there was this brand that was real popular when I was younger called First Down. Some remember First Down. And she took me and got me some First Down clothes, a jacket, some jeans, and I got my first pair of Jordan 13s. They were blue and white. And I was so excited. I was so pumped. Everybody in school saw me as a big deal the, the next day. And, and I remember how I felt. And we were poor, so that was a big sacrifice for my mom. So one of the things I try to do with our, 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 our staff team leads, our kid leads, is I try to get them Jordans for their birthdays. That's just something that I like to do. Whatever the newest and hottest Jordan is, that's, that's what I try to, to do for them. But, you know, because I try to draw this or, or gain this relationship with the kids, when there's problems in school, their parents come to me and say, hey, there's this issue. Hey, they're acting out. Hey, could you, could you talk to them? And so, you know, I'll sit down and I'll have these, these talks and they'll, they'll start telling me why they're acting out or, or why they're getting bad grades. And, and I listen and, you know, and I'll be like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the whole time, because as you get older, you learn to do this, you, you learn to listen more than you speak. And, and what I'm really listening for is to see, is this adding up? Is it adding up? You're all over the place. This, this isn't adding up. And, and like I said, as you get older, you start to look for things to add up. Not just when it's talking to kids, but in a lot of things. Whether it's watching the debates and hearing the back and forth and the stats. I ask myself, is this adding up? You know, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm dealing with my own life, I'm asking myself when things are going wrong, something's not adding up. And so as I talk to the kids and I'm trying to figure out what, what, what is going on, this is not adding up. I'm really trying to pinpoint where is this problem stemming from? Because it's, it's not adding up and it's frustrating when you can hear somebody who's genuine, generally, genuinely frustrated or upset and you can't figure out where it's stemming from. Where is it starting? What is the source? Because something here is just not adding up. And this is also the case with life, as I said. Sometimes you can look at your life and say, man... Where I am now and what I put out, there is something that is not adding up. How I serve the Lord and how wrong everything is going, something is not adding up. Am I the only one that's ever had a season where I said, Lord, when I look at my life, it is not adding up. 
How is somebody like you still single? How is somebody like you all or people like you all still unhappily married? How is somebody that serves and loves the Lord like me so sick? How is somebody that ties week in and week out still struggling with bills? There comes a point where you look at your life and say it's not, it's not adding up. What I'm putting out is not what I'm getting back. There is a reciprocity issue taking place. Paul said in Romans 8.18, he said, for I reckon, I reckon. The word reckon is an accounting term. It's what you do as an accountant when you look at the books. And you look at what, what has gone out and what has come in and you're, you're, you're reckoning the books. And Paul says, when I look back over my life in this reckoning season, because the only reason I would be looking at the books is if I'm having thoughts in my head that something's not adding up. So he says, I reckon, and I'm looking back at my Damascus Road experience, and even before that, I'm looking at, looking back at all the betrayal with my family, the betrayal with my brethren, all the, the stones that were thrown at me at, at Lystra, the shipwreck that took place. I'm looking back, and I'm rec reckoning this at the end of my life. He says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He says, after looking back at my life and reckoning the books, I can tell you this. It's all adding up. Before it's all said and done, your life will all add up. He'll say about 10 verses later, for all things work together for the good of them that love God. Those who are called, called, called. Those who are called and respond, called, called according to his purpose. The word according is a rhythm term. It's a musical term in the Bible. It, it has rhythm to it. So when you hear the word according all through the New Testament, it's, it's an accord. It's being on one accord. It's a musical term. And what he's saying is, I know that all things work together for my good because once I said yes to my calling, I found the rhythm of my life. And as I see the rhythm of my life, I'm starting to see the beauty in my song. You do not see the beauty in your song until you find the rhythm of your life. And you cannot find the rhythm of your life until you say yes to what God is trying to do in and through you. So what does God do to get us to the place where we say yes to the call, where we stop fighting? And like the prodigal son, we stop sitting in hog pens and spending our money on parties and, and women. What does God do to get us to the place where we finally say yes, yes, yes. Whatever you want, you got it. Wherever you want to send me, I'll go. Whoever you want me to remove, they are gone. How do we get to the place where we say yes to what he's trying to do? How do we get to the place where we can start to see our life is starting to add up? It is through this B word that nobody likes called brokenness. I've never met somebody that is used by God that has not been broken. 
And understand this, there are two types of brokenness that will hit you in your life. One is emotional brokenness will hit you when you get saved. This is when somebody you thought would be ride or die is no longer with you. That is emotional brokenness. But emotional brokenness can, 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 cannot even stand in the same realm or category as the next type of brokenness. And the next type of brokenness comes later in your walk, and that is spiritual brokenness. This is where you get so low you start to doubt your faith. This is where you get so low you start to question your salvation. This is where you get so angry that you're frustrated with God. This is the brokenness that God is after. It is spiritual brokenness. It is Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane wrestling against his will and his father's will and he had to be broken into submission. Jesus said, Dad, I don't like the idea of the cross. I don't like the idea of them mishandling me. I don't like the idea of having three-inch nails pressed into my head or thorns. I don't like the idea of being hung up high and stretched out wide. I don't like the idea of standing before a crowd unrecognizable. I don't like the idea... Father, one time, can we change our mind? Father, the second time, can we try another way? Father, the third time, can we come up with a better idea? And all three times, his dad said no. And Jesus had to be broken into submission. And once he understood his father's word, his father's will, it says like a lamb to the slaughter, he didn't utter a word. When the garden was done, he stopped talking. His words would be limited to the, what we call the seven last words. How many would only have seven words after going through everything Jesus went through? But once you understand your father's will, you understand, I have nothing left to say. Once I know what he's trying to do, how can I explain what I don't even understand? How can I explain what I don't even want to do? But this is what happens when you are broken for your calling. Jesus, the Bible says, when he fed the multitude, he, he blessed it, the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he passed it. And that is what we will all go through before it's all said and done. He will bless you. And then he will break you. He will bless you before the brokenness starts. So that way when the brokenness starts and the devil gets in your head, you know I am not trying to get through this for a blessing. I was blessed before it ever started. And if I was blessed before it started, I got to be blessed when I come out of it. So all I really got to do is survive. If I can just survive, I'm going to be blessed. If I can just survive, I'm going to be passed to a multitude. All I got to do is survive this season of brokenness and not throw in the towel and not quit and not walk away and not say I can't do it. But if I can just survive this season, God is going to use my life and pass me. He is not breaking you to bless you because you were blessed before it started. He is breaking you so that he can pass you to people. And the more you are broken, the more you are passed. And people that get passed to a lot of people in the, in the, in the, the realm of being used or ministry are often people that have been broken repeatedly. David, David said this in Psalms 51. He says, Lord, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Not the bones that the devil broke. The bones you broke. Some say, and I've seen pictures of shepherds holding sheep. And they're carrying them on their shoulders. And some say the reason the shepherd is carrying the, the sheep on its shoulders, some say, is because when the sheep leaves the pack, some shepherds break the legs. 
They break the legs so that you know to never walk away again. But God is so full of grace that he doesn't make you drag yourself back. He breaks you and carries you back. How many can look back at your life and see how God carried you back when you walked away? God carried you back when you were ready to quit? And that's how you know you're where God needs you to be. Because even when you wanted to leave, it was God that kept pulling you back over and over and over. And yes, I'm broken. And yes, I can't walk. But I know that it was out of love that God not only broke me, but he carried me back to my destiny. David says, Lord, make the bones you broke. Rejoice. This is what it looks like when you're spiritually broken. You're not begging God for money. You're not begging God for a man or a woman. You're just begging God to be happy. Make me rejoice again. There are people here that cannot remember the last time you were just gen genuinely happy. No money and happy. No relationship and happy. Marriage isn't where you want it to be, but you're still happy. Sick and happy. Bad job and happy. When's the last time you were happy with your life? He says a little further, he says, you know, one thing God wants, the sacrifices of God are what? A broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. David says what God is after is a broken spirit and a broken heart. Because once he breaks you, you'll stop fighting over him or with him over what he's trying to do in your life. So why does God use pain? Or what does God use pain for? to get our attention. Let's understand the pain a little bit. Number one, God breaks us or allows the pain to come in for our spirituality. He wants us to be more spiritual. The Bible says when you're carnally minded, you are an enemy with God. What does carnally minded mean? It does not mean you go to clubs and you sleep around, all that kind of stuff. That's how the old church would teach it. You're carnal. No, the word carnality means or carnal means you live by your senses. Okay. So you made me angry, so I say red words to destroy you. You're like your father. You're like your mother. You're a joke. You're pathetic. All that kind of stuff. That is carnality. That is not spirituality. That is not speaking to a person like they are made in the image of God. God looks for spirituality. He looks for you to handle things spiritually. And yes, all the fleshly things that come with, with, with our senses is sin, going to the wrong places, doing the wrong things. I'm not minimizing those things. I'm just saying that to be carnal is much broader than we make it. I'm angry, so I'm leaving. I'm done with you. All, all of that stuff is done in our senses. And what happens is when we don't do things from a spiritual standpoint, the Bible says everything that God does, every good gift, every perfect gift, every blessing God has for us, the Bible says is found in spiritual places. So if we do not become spiritual, we'll never figure out what God has for us. And ultimately to be more spiritual means that we are in tune with God. So God breaks us to take our spirituality serious. Number two, why does God use pain? He uses pain to help us get to a place of success. He has to get our attention. He does not like seeing us live in, in a state of failing. 
So he breaks us because he wants us to be a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. He, he wants to show us off. He wants to brag about us. He, he don't light the lamp, he said, and put it underneath the bed. No, he puts it on the lampstand so everybody can see it. God gets glory when you look good. God gets glory when Joseph goes from a pit and a prison to a palace. God loves to put you in a position where your co-workers and your family say, how did you do it? And you say, every good thing I have came from God. It came from his goodness. It came from his faithfulness to me. The man, the woman, the house, the career, the savings, it's all because of God. God loves to make success stories. So God has to break us because often we will stay drowning in the swamp, drowning in the quicksand, moving and moving and moving and sinking more and more. So what does God do? He has to break us for success. God has to use pain to teach us survival. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Survival. God allows pain to come into your life so you have a testimony. So you have some strength. So that you can look back over your life and see his track record of bringing you through things and know that if he brought me through that, he's going to bring me through this. He's going to bring me through the next thing. If he got me through the lion and the bear, he's going to bring down this giant. God uses pain to teach you how to survive. It is for survival's sake. God uses pain to make you stronger. The Bible says, let patience have her work, her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. God uses pain to build strength, to build perseverance, to build endurance, so that when you get the blessing and somebody threatens to take it, it doesn't put you in a place of fear. God has a way of building you up through pain. I've never seen somebody truly great that has not been through a true amount of pain. And truthfully, I think your pain qualifies you for your purpose. And lastly, God has to break you to get you to a place where you no longer fight Submission. Submission. Where does the word submission come from? It's a Latin word that has two meanings. It means submitting to a mission. So, husbands, when you tell your wife to practice submission, the first thing you need to be able to clarify is what is our mission? Where are we going? What's our 10-year, 20-year, 30-year plan? Where do we want to be? when we're 70. What's the mission? And not only what is the mission, how am I included in the mission? It's easy to submit to somebody that's going somewhere, that can articulate where they're taking you. It's frustrating to follow a parked car. How many are like me, you drive in the fast lane, and then there's that one car that goes like 60 miles an hour in a 65, and it brings out the worst version of me. Why is it? Because I'm in a lane that says I'm going fast, but I'm stuck behind somebody that wants to do the speed limit. Yeah, that's good. There's nothing worse than wanting to get somewhere fast, but stuck behind slow. Submission. Submission. The Bible says, submit ye one to another. This is in the context in Ephesians 5 of the church. A church without submission is a church without structure. It is a church that has gone wild. Submit ye one to another. And then he takes it a little bit further and talks about wives and husbands. He says, let every wife be, be subject 
or submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, we read this from the standpoint of husbands and wives, but it actually is not talking about husbands and wives. It is dealing with the church in Christ. It is, it is telling the church that as a church we are to submit to Jesus. And when we understand what the marriage represents, then we understand that if the husband's responsibility is to be like Jesus and the wife's responsibility is to be like the church, then that makes the kids the unsaved world. And your kids are either going to hate church or love church based upon how they see mom and dad representing Jesus and his bride. It is a, a, a bigger picture than we make it. But in the context of the text, Paul is telling us there has to be submission. Like the shepherd getting the lamb broken to submit, there has to be a submission that takes place in our lives. And submission is broad, but the Bible makes it clear there are people we are supposed to submit to because I'm going to show you before you leave that if you can't articulate one person that you submit to in this world, then you are not in the will of God. It is submission. Hebrews chapter 13 says, Obey those that have rule over you. Submit yourselves, for they watch over your souls, that they must give an account that they do it with joy and not with grief. That is unprofitable for you. God puts people in our lives to submit to. And you're so stubborn, that's why you're still single. And God is saying, I'm looking for people that will take a breath and say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, it is not my will be done. It is your will be done. And side note, it's hard to submit to somebody that doesn't submit to anybody. Because you reap what you sow. You're telling me to submit, but you don't submit to nobody. Romans chapter 12, and this is going to get good in a minute, but I'm laying, laying, laying the, the groundwork out. I beseech you, Paul says, I'm, I'm begging, get this. By the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What Paul is saying is the ultimate act of submission to God is to lay down your life to what he's trying to do. Because when you lay down your life to God, what you are telling God is, God, I trust you. I trust you. The reason submission is so important is because if you don't submit, you'll never be in position when God is trying to use you. And one of the biggest things that God looks for is position. Position, position, position. Because I'm going to show you today that often when God is trying to get you in position, it is because he's trying to show you off. Luke chapter 14, and then we're jumping into Esther, says this, a certain man made a great supper and bade many. This is Jesus telling a parable. And he sent the servant at the supper time saying to those that were bidden, come, all things are now ready. When he calls you, it is because there's something ready with your life. There's something he's trying to do. The call has gone out and they all with one accord can consent began to make excuses the first said unto him I have bought a piece of ground I must needs go see it I pray thee let me be excused the first one says I have a business venture I bought some property I can't make it today this got to be a good excuse it's money on the line Jesus okay Another said, I bought five oak of oxen. I got to go prove them. I pray, let me be excused. 
And another said, I married a wife. You know, the house comes first, Jesus. That's my first ministry. I married a wife. I therefore can't come. My problem with the text is, why'd you marry somebody that wasn't as passionate about church as you? But nevertheless, all three made excuses when he called them. So the servant came and said, I, I told him what you said. And the master of the house was angry. He said, go quickly to the streets, the lanes, the city. Bring the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. And the servant of the Lord said, it is done as you commanded, yet there's still room. The Lord of the servant said, go to the highways and the hedges. Compel them to come that, the, that my house may be filled. For I say that none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. None of the men, the men, the men, the men. None of the men that did not submit will get to taste of my goodness. Because they weren't in position. And what does God do? Does he send them to hell? No. Once you get saved, you're always saved. But what does God do when we don't submit? What does God do when we're not in position? He says, on to the next one. He leaves Saul and goes after David. He says, okay, Orpha, it's not you, it's Ruth. He doesn't stop because we don't want to get on the agenda with him, he moves on to somebody who will. And that's what the emphasis of the whole book of Esther is about. It is one person battling to submit and another whose whole life has been nothing but brokenness and in a way, God has built them to submit. Let's talk about Esther just a little bit before we get into the story. The book of Esther is a unique book in the Bible. It's the only book in the Bible where God's name or God alone is not mentioned once. You will read the whole book of Esther and you will never see God in it as far as his name goes. G-O-D. You will not see those letters in the Bible in the book of Esther. But what's so cool about it is you don't see God's name in the book of Esther. But you see God moving through the whole book of Esther. Why is this important? Because there will be moments in your life where you can't trace God. There will be moments in your life where his name is not on bright lights. There will be moments in your life where it looks like he forgot about you. There will be moments in your life where you say, God, it's not adding up. There will be moments in your life where you say, how could this happen to somebody like me? There will be moments in your life where you say, God, why am I so sick? Why am I so broken? Why am I so hurting? Why am I so lonely? Why am I so attacked? There will be moments in your life where you will not be able to trace or track God. But be careful before you speak too quickly. Because just because you can't trace God, just because you can't track God, doesn't mean that God is not moving. Does not mean that God is not doing something. It does not mean that God is not up to something. It does not mean that God is not touching hearts and making ways out of no ways. It doesn't mean that God does not have you on, your, on his mind. So when you can't feel God and the enemy is trying to tell you where is your God now? You're able to stand flat footed and say, I can't see him. I don't hear him, but I know he loves me too much to leave me where I am. He's up to something in my life. Is there anybody that believes that even though things don't look good and even though things haven't been good and even though the enemy has been running wild. God is up to something while you're in church. God is up to something while you're watching online. God is up to something while you're in the hospital. God is up to something while you're going to therapy because if God wanted to take you out, he would have let that thing do its job. But the fact that you are here today is an indicator that your best days are still ahead of you say he's moving God was moving all through the book of Esther as we will see 
God was moving in such a way that to prepare their queen, he would allow her to grow up without her mother and father. See, what most people don't understand is that whenever God sends somebody into your life, and he'll never pull you out of something without sending a person, all through the scriptures, you will never see a group of people or a person get changed without a person coming into their life. So be careful when you push away every person that God sends to help you because you could be pushing away your deliverer. Yes. God always sends a person. And what happens is most people don't understand how broken that person had to become to be qualified to pull you out. If Esther had to be the queen of a nation, her tolerance for pain had to be equal to that calling. So what did God allow to happen to Esther to make her qualified? He allowed her to be an orphan. He allowed her to miss out on little girl experiences. She was the child that went to school jealous on mom and daughter days. She was the child that went to school jealous when it was bring your father to school days. She never had a mother, never had a father. Through the most pivotal times of her life, she just had to figure them out. And often when you have to figure things out, you tend to make more mistakes than you're proud of. God will allow this girl's life to be turned upside down. Her name means star. Esther means a star. Some say a star in the making is what her name meant. Imagine being called a star. A shining star. When everything about your life looks like it's falling. And who would have thought that throughout her lonely childhood, God was preparing a queen? Who would have thought when people felt sorry for her, that one day she would have a heavy crown on her head? Esther came from nothing. The book of Esther takes place after Nehemiah and after Ezra went back to Jerusalem, it's, it's dealing with the Jews that stayed in Babylon. And since they stayed in Babylon, they put themselves in a position to almost be destroyed. See, sometimes we can stay in something too long and get destroyed in it. Have you ever stayed in something too long and lost yourself? stayed in something too long and now your heart is so tied to it that though the people you know are leaving, it's impossible for you to leave. Esther is written concerning the Jews that stayed in Babylon. And as we'll see, the antagonist or the enemy throughout the book of Esther is a man named Haman who was a descendant of Agag, the people that Saul was told to kill, but he let one slide. And that's why God had to replace him, because Saul was looking at it as something small. But God saw hundreds of years down the line that this thing that you see as small will destroy my people one day. We'll talk about that in the coming weeks. Esther. Esther chapter 2 tells us, was raised by her cousin Mordecai. He was a scribe to the king, a Jewish scribe. Mordecai, he raised her. His name means servant. He was teaching her how to serve as a little girl. He was teaching her how to love God as a little girl. He, 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 you know, it's different to be raised by an older person than a younger person. It's different to be raised by your grandparents compared 
as to a 20-year-old mother and father. Old people tend to tolerate little things. She was raised by an older man. It does not say that he was married. He just had a heart for the young girl and took her in. And he taught her how to serve. He taught her scribe ways, how to write and how to listen. He taught her how to read. He was preparing her for her purpose. She didn't get to do what all the other girls did. She never had her nails done. Her hair probably looked a mess if a man had to do it. She didn't dress girly probably. But he did the best he could. And who would have thought that while Esther was coming up in Susan on the other side of Babylon, God was beginning the process of getting her purpose together. I told you that in the book of Esther, you don't see the name of God mentioned. But actually, all throughout Esther's early years, you really don't even see God mentioned. Where is God when my parents died? Where is God when I'm trying to figure out how to be a woman and the person that should show me is not here? Where is God? Esther's life screamed, where is God? And a lot of her life would never make sense to her until she got older. A lot of her life would never add up until one day that the king needed her. See, there will come a day in all of our lives that the king needs us. Our lives will not change because of a promotion. If the promotion changes our lives, it's because the king saw we needed it to make the kingdom better. There comes a day where the king needs all of us. And I don't know when it's going to happen. And I don't know how it's going to happen. But all I know is, I want to be in position when the king needs me. I want to be ready when the king needs me. David was called the king at age 16 and then went back to the sheep. He was called the king. The oil was put on his head. He had the anointing and then went back to a dead-end job. It is frustrating to know that you're called to greatness and then go back to a dead-end situation. But he kept serving. His father sent them on the battlefield to serve his brothers. He didn't say, did you not see the king come and anoint the prophet come and anoint me king? No, no, no. He said, yes, dad. He was in position. And because he submitted to his father as a king in the making, he submitted to his father. He was in position when Goliath came out. If he would have been stubborn, if he would have made an excuse, his lack of submission would have kept him out of position for the moment the king needed him. And because David was in position, see, you see Goliath as a giant problem. Goliath was David's giant opportunity. See, what's one person's problem is your opportunity. So David steps out, and I know it's his opportunity because they're all sitting around with wet pants. David says, who is this uncircumcised? Everybody in the army of Israel is looking at Goliath and saying, oh, my. David is looking below his belt and saying, oh, my. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? While everybody's looking up, David's taking a peek of what's beneath. And David says, you think this fleshly person is going to beat God? You are crazy. You know it's supposed to be yours while everybody else is looking up. And you're looking down. And you're trying to figure out, how does God get glory in me doing this? It was his opportunity. 
the king has a way of calling. Saul, he may call you on the road to Damascus, but when the king calls, if you say yes, your whole life is going to change. Are we in position for the king to call? And Esther had the best type of teacher. See, here at Uproar, when I was in church, I came up in old school churches where if you messed up, I don't care what it was, if you messed up, the pastor would actually pull you on the stage and say, church, we're going to pray for Brother James. Brother James fell into some sin. And he's going to be taking a break from ministry for a little bit. We're going to pray for him, okay? And we're going to sit him down for a season. And that's what they would do. I don't ever see a Jesus doing that. I see a Jesus stepping in stones for people like, in front of stones for people like that. I see Jesus blocking people that the crowd tries to pull up and condemn. I've learned in life, People are going to struggle their way to success. People are going to grapple. And when you get to heaven, there's going to be people in heaven that you don't think should have made it. Because one thing I've learned about God is when God is ready to save a person, he doesn't always deal with the areas you want him to deal with. So it's best to shut up and let them go through their process. Because you're so focused on the addiction and you're so focused on the sin and you're so focused on the flesh and you don't realize that God is so much bigger than you and his ways are not your ways. So while you're worried about the outside, God is going deep and dealing with childhood trauma. God is going deep and dealing with brokenness. God is going deep and dealing with that molestation. God is going deep and dealing with that abandonment. And, and he may never get to that thing you think disqualifies them. But it doesn't mean they're not saved. It means that they are a work in progress. There are some ladies here, and I don't give none of us men credit, though some of you could probably get credit. I'm going to give most of the women credit and be biased. But there are some ladies here that I know can throw down and clean a house. I mean, dust in every corner, you know, dust on the blinds, on the fan, you name it, can throw down with cleaning a house. But how many people have ever gone to clean a house and got frustrated when you looked at the whole house that was a mess? You can't start on the whole house at once, so what do you do? You start on one room. You start on the room that everybody's going to come into first, the living room. We'll deal with everything else later. Let's get the room for the party tonight done. One room at a time. That's how God does it too. He goes into one room at a time. And I may look at your life and say, man, God, you need to get in that bedroom right now. God says, let me do the basement first. Let me do the kitchen first. And this is going to take 30 years to get done because when I'm done, they'll be ready to come home to me. So until they come home to be with me, just trust if they got saved, I'm in some room in their life right now working. So don't judge them because your judging them may cause them to quit the cleaning process. So rather say, I'm praying for you in this season. I'm praying that God would help you in this season. I'm not judging you. Let God be God. And perhaps the reason he hasn't gotten to the room I want him to get to is because it has nothing to do with you. He's trying to teach me something about me and push me to my knees to pray. God has a way of doing what he wants to do, how he wants to do it, when he wants to do it. And he doesn't need our help in the process. Esther has been being raised for such a time as this. She is not being raised by somebody who is all about whippings. She is being raised by somebody whose name means servant. And that's where I was going with that story that I've learned in building a church. I don't beat people up for their struggles. 
hear an uproar. I beat people up for their lack of being in position. I came from churches that beat me up for my struggles while I was in position. I've never seen a Jesus beat somebody up for their struggles. I have seen a Jesus replace people that were out of position. So Esther is being raised by somebody who is giving her a foundation of serving. Serving. Meanwhile, on the other side of Babylon, the king is having a party. Hey, ho. And it's, it's an out of control kind of party because he's drunk. And he gets this idea. He says, get my wife. I want to show her off real quick. Somebody call Vashti. But the problem was that Vashti had her own party happening at the same time. And she allowed her party to get bigger than the king's party. She allowed her party to get more important than the king's party. And this is where we blow it. If we're not careful, we allow our parties to get bigger than the king's party. Like, like the guy who went to look at the oxen, his party got bigger than the king's party. Like, like the man that wanted to spend time with his wife, his party got bigger than the king's party. Like, like the man that wanted to look at a piece of property, his party got bigger than the king's party. And whenever your party gets bigger than the king's party, it is, it is an indication that the king is about to move on. Vashti did not realize that at any given moment, the king could be done with you. How are you not answering the king's call. And this shows us that when we are not practicing submission, it keeps us from being in position. And so on the other side of town, back to Esther, she's being trained how to serve. She's being trained how to respond to authority. On the Backside of Babylon, this queen has forgotten what it is like to have a relationship with the king. If we're not careful, we can forget what it is like to have a relationship with the king. I've been saved for 20 years. Got saved at the New Year's Eve service. I've been saved for 20 years. You know why I keep going? You know why I preach good times, preach bad times, in season, out of season, times up, times down? It's because I've never lost my gratefulness to have a relationship with the king. Whenever you lose that thing, that keeps your fire burning, that love for God, that love for serving him, that love for saying thank you, that love for, that says, Lord, whatever you want from me, you got it. Whatever you need, I'm there. Whenever you lose that, you are done. You are just going through the motions, Vashti, having your own party within the king's party and making your own party bigger than his. And it says that the king was so angry. He said, I never want her to see my face again. Dude, this is your wife. This is your bride. But it shows that no matter how high you get, if you take your eyes off the prize, God will move on. Your soul will get to heaven, but your rewards will be stripped. Your soul will stand before the king, 
but all the crowns will be taken away. Because God looks for people that are in position. The king calls every day. When we look back as we're in the fourth quarter of 2024, when you look back over 2024, how many times did your party become bigger than his? And sometimes my party is not something that comes before him or necessarily uh, something that I'm doing. Sometimes my party can be my pity party. And we wonder why it's Groundhog Day year after year after year. And God is saying, the reason life has not changed is because I cannot get you to change. And 20 more years is going to zip by. You're going to be in the same seat in the same church wondering, God, when is my life going to add up? This woman had everything. And it was snatched. And the reason that God had to move on, it wasn't that the king didn't love her no more. Understand that. It never says the queen was not loved. It actually made him angry that he had to do this. And ladies, listen to me clearly. Men, you should amen me and put a dollar on the offering <laughs> at the altar. Whenever a man gets angry, it's because he cares. When he shuts up and rolls over, he's done. If your man is laying, you know, on the bed, right on that crease, and you wonder sometimes, how are you not falling off? It's because he has already left you. If there is no pillow talk taking place, how was your day? Yeah, this was going on, that was going on. He is there, but he is not there with you no more. He cannot trust you with his pillow secrets any longer because every time he shares them, you have something to say. The brothers are looking at me like I'm not looking to the left or to the right right now. But it's true. You should be happy that he still gets angry. You should be happy that he still raises his voice sometimes. It's a sign that he's still there. It's a sign that he still loves you. It's a sign that he's still connected. It's a sign that he's not running around. It's a sign that he's still committed to the relationship. And though he may have made some mistakes, his heart is still with you. It wasn't a love thing. Like King Saul, it wasn't a love thing. He did not love Saul no more. But why'd you replace him? Because they said that if you don't replace Vashti King, this is going to reproduce. And I cannot have her on the stage and all the women acting like her. So King, this is bigger than you. King Xerxes, this is not your will. This is God's will be done. And so the king had to make the toughest decision of his life to never again see his wife. And he was angry. But I told you that God never leaves a position void. If it's not Saul, it will be David. If it's not Judas, it will be Matthias. He has something he has to get done. Why? Because there's a lot on the line. What's on the line? There's a date that Jesus is coming back. There's a date that the sky is going to crack. There's a day that the trumpets will trump. There's a day that those of the Old Testament will come in with the angels riding in on the clouds. Jesus is coming back whether we like it or not. There will be a rapture. There will be people walking with each other. One taken, one left. There will be people in the 
the field, one taken, one left. People at work, one taken, one left. There is a day that we don't know, but he knows, and there are things that have to fall in line before he comes back. So he loves you, but he has to move on. He loves you, but he's got a lot on the line. And I don't know about you, but I made up in my mind when I got saved, whatever you're doing, God, I want to be a part of it. Whatever battle you're fighting, it's my battle. Wherever you need me, I'll go. Whatever you want, you can take it, God, because I know there's a lot on the line, and, and, and I want my life Amen. to add up Amen. when it's all said and done. Amen. And so the queen had to be replaced by a girl who's been in the making, a girl who all these years of brokenness, man, look at how spiritual she is. She is so spiritual, she will teach the king about people in the Bible. She is so spiritual that she will set standards when all the other girls lose their mind, as we'll see next week. She is proud of her uniqueness. She loves the way she looks. She was the only girl that went before the king that refused to wear makeup. She refused to be with him alone unless he knew her name. Say my name, say my name. <laughs> she refused to, she set standards for her life. What caused her to step into a moment and keep her dignity where other people were losing their minds? It's from all of those years of brokenness. She's so spiritual. She has been broken to be successful in her life. There comes a point where you say, God, I've been too broken to not be something in my life. She has been broken. She has survival instincts. She had to survive. She didn't have her mother or her father. She didn't have a playbook. Even being a wife probably scared her to death because she never had a good model of what being a wife looked like. But she's a survivor. And the one thing about a survivor, a survivor says that whatever God puts me in, he'll teach me how to survive it. She was a survivor. She had strength. Her strength through the whole book is undeniable. She would risk her life when it came to God's agenda, as we'll see next week or the week after. She had so much strength. And being raised by a man whose name means servant, she knew the power of submission. She knew that King Xerxes would never ask me to jump on one foot and bark like a dog. <laughs> she knew the power of submission. And God had to break her to teach her how to submit to the king. Her life prepared her for the moment. And who would have thought that one person's blown opportunity would become her chance of a lifetime. Her name means star. And who would have thought that when they called her Esther, that God didn't make a mistake. Her childhood may not have looked much like a star but she was a star in the making. And she was in position when the king called. The king is going to call you. And understand, I've, I've never had, everything that I've ever done in my life has never been by a divine revelation. It's never been by a dream, by God saying, go. It's always been through me listening. Because God speaks through people. When I came to Owings Mills, 
I didn't know nothing about Owings Mills. I didn't grow up in Owings Mills. There, one of our oldest members, Sania, lived out here, and she would drive from here to Glen Burnie. And she said, we need a location in Owings Mills one day. And she used to just say it, I think, because she didn't feel like driving to Glen Burnie all the time. Uh, <laughs> but she came faithfully every week, served every week, had her badge on every week. And she said, we should have a church in Owings Mills one day. And whenever people are serious enough to serve, then I think I need to be serious enough to let them have my ear. Because perhaps the Lord is speaking through his servant. It's not always the servant on the stage. Because even through our text, as we're going to see, God speaks through servants all around. And it was a seed that pl was planted. And I started to drive out here and look around out here. And I started to feel a peace about God out here. And I moved out here. When I got saved, my pastor said I needed somebody to drive the church van. That was the king speaking. I started growing, and the pastor said, you should come to minister's trainings. I was scared. I was reckless. I was still sleeping around. I was still getting drunk on Saturday's nights. But I said, the king must be speaking. I did it. I got involved. Then he said, you should go to Bible college. I got this guy that'll pay for you to go to Bible college and get a four-year bachelor's and an associate's degree in theology. It was the king speaking. I was a construction worker, a union electrician at the time. I was boxing still too, but I said, okay, king. And when I had to give up something, I gave up boxing, even though I loved it, and I did it since I was nine years old. I was a Golden Glove champion, all that. I gave it up because the king wasn't speaking to me about boxing. And then I started doing a Bible study at a Panera Bread, and it grew to about 25 people in Glen Burnie. And people started saying, you should start a church. I talked to my pastor. He okayed it. I said, the king is speaking. Because God always puts a person in your life to speak on his behalf. God, you cannot see. He's omnipresent, but you will not see him unless you lived 2,000 years ago or so and saw Jesus. But what does the invisible God do? He gives you a visible person and says, if you love me, listen. Paul says, those things you've seen, heard, and witnessed in me do, and the God of peace will be with you. He puts people in your life to see how well can you submit. Because the king is going to use somebody to call you. Remember the man with the party, he sent his servant. He didn't tell nobody, but he sent his servant to invite people. You know, every week I am not the person hosting the party. I am the servant inviting people. I am the servant telling people he wants the house filled. I am the servant telling people we got to compel him to come. I, I am not the master, I am just the servant. And God will always send a servant into your life to tell you what the king wants from you. Who's the last servant you've listened to? And maybe that's the reason the king cannot pull you forth to show you off. For no man lights a candle to hide it. Whenever God is asking you to submit like Queen Vashti, it is always because you are getting ready to enter a season where he is going to show you off. And God is trying to, in this season, show somebody off. And maybe it's to show you off as a wife. Maybe it's to show you off as a business owner. Maybe it's to show you off as a giver. Maybe it's to show you off as a singer, a preacher, a book writer. Whatever it is, he never calls you or gives you a message that's so uncomfortable like this unless he's trying to pull you to another level. And I wonder how many people today can feel that God is trying to pull me to another level. But I've made my party bigger than his party. And meanwhile, somewhere right now is an Esther in the making. 
for a Vashti that's too busy. And she don't even know who she is right now. And he doesn't even know who he is right now. He's just coming to church. She's just coming to church looking for a word, not realizing that their whole life has been a life of brokenness because God was preparing them for a message like this to get them ready for a kingdom. A kingdom that one person took lightly is going to be the kingdom that you become a star in. Where is the star in the making? Where is the person whose earliest memories are a memory of trauma? That's the Esther. Where is the person who didn't have the best mother or the best father? That is the Esther. Who is the person that God, in spite of everything the devil tried to take from you, put a Mordecai in your life to show you how to serve? They couldn't teach you a lot, Esther, but they taught you how to serve. They taught you how to serve. They taught you how to be in position. They taught you how to not call out. They taught you how to be there when God needs you. Not by what they said, but by what they did. Mordecai, Esther, is God's way of reaching out to you to say, I love you. You, you weren't in the best hands coming up necessarily, but I put somebody in your life that would care about you and help you get to where I'm trying to take you. Maybe God sent me to be a Mordecai to you, to prepare you for your kingdom. Somebody said this, and I'm, I'm done. We're out of here. We had women. Lady, where are you, where are you at, ladies? Y'all y'all sh showed up. Y'all showed up. And uh, the ladies had ladies' night on, on Friday, and somebody said, how do you decide who speaks? Because they don't decide who gets up there. I decide that. I know everything that happens in the church because I'm the pastor. I got to know what people are hearing. I got to know what's being said. I was watching on the YouTube because this week we're going to debrief and I'm going to coach them on how they could do better and, and what they did great and all that kind of stuff. I got notes. But somebody said, how do you decide who gets on the stage? I said, it's easy. I look for who's always in position. I look for people that are in position when they feel like it, in position when they don't feel like it. I look for people that are always showing up. I look for people that are asking Bible questions and not talking about garbage. I like when people stop me and talk about the sermon. I look for people that draw to leaders and not try to make friends every Sunday. That's how I saw Amaris growing. She started drawing to the leader. She wasn't here to make friends and in huddles and clicks. No, she was drawing to the leader, always following them around and following them around. And I said, that's a leader in the making right there. I'm always watching. They say, I got eyes in the back of my head. I'm always watching. I'm looking for the next man that has that glow in his eyes. Like, man, I want to do this. I want somebody to believe in me. I need a mentor. I need somebody I can talk to. I've got so much on my chest. I didn't have a father. I don't have a father. I, I really wish I could have somebody show me how to do this thing. I'm always looking because I was that guy with that glow. And I know what it's like to go from church to church and pastors put me in position and use me to take care of their kids and take, have pizza parties for their kids as a youth pastor. And I had to beg for just a coffee meeting with them. And I'm always looking. I'm always looking. And if God could use an ass to speak to people in the Bible, I'll take whoever is hungry and wants to be used by God, whether they're a drug addict, whether they're struggling, whether they don't got it together right now, whether they're shacking up in this season. Notice I say this season. It won't stay that way, but this season. 
I will use anybody that says yes to the call. But I will test them for a season to see, can you do what you're given to do with excellence and stay in position? Because you've got to be tested so that you can prove and you can know for yourself that you are ready for what you're stepping into. There is somebody here that is ready today. And I don't know who you are, but you are ready. For such a time as this, you are ready. God prepared you. Before you ever got saved, you were prepared for your destiny. And today is the day that you say yes to the call and step into, Esther, the life God has been preparing for you.